Imagine stepping back in time, way before our world as we know it, to an era vividly depicted in the early chapters of the Bible. Picture a world where the threads of history weave a narrative of ancient humanity, a time long before the transformative deluge that reshaped the course of human existence. As you delve into the intricate tapestry of interpretations and age-old stories, you'll encounter a fascinating epoch filled with divine encounters and profound connections to God. This is the world before the Great Flood, a time marked by characters like Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, and eventually, Noah. Join us on this captivating journey as we seek to unravel the mysteries that envelope this pre-Diluvian era. In this bygone age, characterized by extended lifespans and intimate interactions with the divine, humanity lived in close proximity to God. The creation story itself unfolds, revealing the relatable lives of individuals who played pivotal roles in shaping this ancient world. As we explore further, we discover that the forces converging to bring about the flood include not only the human characters but also supernatural entities. Satan and the fallen angels, in a pre-creation event, set the stage for the momentous flood. In the book of Job, God unveils an occurrence that predates the world's foundation, a glimpse into the creation of the sons of God. So, as we navigate through this enthralling exploration of a world before the flood, be prepared to uncover the secrets and intricacies of an era shrouded in the mists of time, where the foundations of the earth were laid, and the destiny of humanity was yet to be shaped. Good morning. Have you ever heard about the moment when the morning stars sang together, and the sons of God, the angels, shouted for joy? It's amazing to think that these angelic beings witnessed the creation of the earth and celebrated the glory, power, and wisdom of God involved in that process. Before the flood, however, there was a fallen being. The Bible briefly mentions fallen angels because the vast majority of angels in heaven never strayed or turned to evil. Some, however, made that decision, even though heaven was intended to be their home for all eternity. It's interesting to understand why this originally occurred. We can't deny the fact that angels have free will. Their fallen state can be seen in terms of their freedom of choice. The book of Jude makes this point clear by mentioning that some angels did not keep their designated place of power, abandoning their proper dwelling place. These fallen angels were kept in eternal chains under the thick gloom of utter darkness, awaiting judgment on the great day. Jude concluded that these angels did not keep their proper domain. The phrase, proper domain, can be interpreted as either rule or starting point. Angels were specifically made to dwell in heaven with God, worship Him, and carry out His commands. They were created to bring glory to Him, just as we were made to worship and follow God. It's fascinating to reflect on the complexity of these events and the crucial role that free will played in the history of angels. You know, people were made to live on earth, while angels were created to dwell in heaven. However, some of these angels decided to leave their original place in heaven. Surprisingly, Satan, who disguises himself as an angel of light, leads these rebellious angels. There was even a significant event called the Great Rebellion, in which Satan and a portion of heaven's angelic legions waged war against God and his angels in an attempt to overthrow divine authority in the eternal sphere. This malicious plot was devised by the devil to overthrow God, their creator. However, they ended up being defeated in the battle. Jesus himself witnessed this event, speaking about the glory and majesty he shared with God the Father before the existence of the world. It's interesting to note that before the creation of the earth, God already existed with all his majesty, including his son Jesus. Jesus mentioned having seen Satan fall from heaven like lightning. This indicates that Satan is not just a red figure with horns and a pitchfork but an ancient being with true spiritual power used for evil and selfish purposes. 
Paul reminds us that we are engaged in a spiritual battle, not against flesh and blood, but against the organized forces of Satan's kingdom, which has different areas and levels of authority, with its headquarters in heavenly regions. All of this leads us to reflect on what life was like before the flood, as narrated in the early chapters of the Bible. It's fascinating to realize how these spiritual events impact the history of humanity. Hey, have you ever delved into the book of Genesis? It's like stepping into a whole different world, way before our time. Picture this, early chapters of the Bible unfold a tale of a world long before the big flood changed everything. It's a fascinating journey through the ancient stories and interpretations of early humanity. You've got Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, and Noah, these characters bring the whole era to life. Before the flood, life was something else. Long life spans, divine encounters, and this crazy closeness to God. Imagine that. There's this creation story with a bunch of characters, and it's like peeling back layers to reveal the mysteries of that time. And get this, forces like Satan and the fallen angels, they played a part in making the flood happen. But here's the kicker, the first event that set the whole flood thing in motion. It went down even before the world was created. In the book of Job, there's this mind-blowing revelation about an event predating the earth's creation. God goes all, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? It's like a sneak peek into the cosmic drama before the curtain even went up. Morning stars singing, angels doing their thing, it's a wild ride through a world that's a bit hard to wrap our heads around but totally worth the exploration. Wow, imagine this, there was a time when angelic beings, called morning stars and sons of God, were so thrilled witnessing the creation of the earth. They were all about celebrating the incredible power, wisdom, and glory of God in this process. But, hold on, before everything got messed up, there was this fallen being, not a lot of details about them in the Bible, just a passing mention of fallen angels. You know, most angels in heaven are doing just fine, staying true to their heavenly path. However, some of them, for reasons we're not entirely sure of, decided to go off track. Crazy, right? Heaven was supposed to be their forever home, but they chose to bail. Now, let's talk about the root cause. We can't ignore the fact that angels, unlike robots, have free will. And it's this free will thing that got some of them into trouble. The book of Jude is pretty clear about it. Jude 5-6 basically says, Hey, don't forget that after God saved a bunch of people from Egypt, He later wiped out those who didn't believe or trust Him. Same goes for the angels, some didn't stick to their designated place of power and went off wandering. Jude concluded that these angels messed up by not keeping to their proper domain. Now, proper domain can mean either their rule or their starting point. Angels were originally made to hang out in heaven, worship God, and follow His commands. It was their gig, you know. Just like how us humans were designed to chill on earth. So, long story short, some angels went off script, and now they're stuck in chains and darkness, awaiting judgment day. Wild, huh? In heaven, despite this, these angels left their beginning, which is another way of saying that they departed from their initial location in heaven. Satan, who disguises himself as an angel of light, is in charge of these angels and acts as their leader. The Great Rebellion as some call it, was an event in which Satan and a portion of heaven's angelic legions waged war against God and his angels in an attempt to overthrow God's authority in the everlasting sphere. The devil devised a plot to overthrow God, his creator, and he and the angels that followed him ended up being defeated in the conflict. We get an account of this from Jesus himself, as he was present. Now, the Father glorifies me together with yourself, with the glory and majesty that I had with you before the world existed, 
John 17 verse 5, Amplified Bible. Before the creation of the earth, there was God, and God had majesty with His Son. Jesus declares, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. As can be seen, Satan is much more than a red figure with horns and a pitchfork, he is an ancient being with real spiritual power, which he uses for evil and selfish ends. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, Paul said. We are in a wrestling match, but it's not against flesh and blood. Satan's kingdom is highly organized, with different areas and levels of authority, and its headquarters are in heavenly regions. This is a staggering fact, but it is quite clear that as the population grew, so did the need for different roles and professions. People couldn't only be herders and farmers. Hey, so back in the day, things needed a bit of a shake-up. Take Cain, for example. He was into farming, which helped society get its act together and become more organized. That set the stage for some fancy civilizations down the road. But, let's be real, life wasn't all sunshine and rainbows before the big flood. According to the Bible, the big guy upstairs looked down and saw that people were up to no good. Like, really no good. It says everyone's thoughts were pretty much evil 24-7. Fast forward to the pre-flood era, and things got interesting. Families grew, and they started being called the sons of God. In the book of Job, they're almost like angelic beings. Picture it, two-thirds of these angelic beings hung out with God in the third heaven, living the good life. The other third, led by Satan, didn't get the memo and decided to mess with humanity. These fallen angels landed on earth and, well, things got weird. They even had offspring with humans, creating a bunch of giants called Nephilim. The name itself means, fallen, reflecting this whole dark invasion scenario in Genesis 6. So, you've got these giants roaming around, and the big guy decides to put a cap on human lifespan at 120 years. But, the Nephilim legacy lives on, causing a lot of chaos. The earth wasn't exactly a peaceful, friendly place, more like a hot mess filled with all sorts of drama. In a life without violence and betrayal, neighbors don't look out for each other but seek to exploit one another. Governments are not institutions of justice but rather systems of oppression upholding the rule of the powerful over the weak. Now, imagine in this chaotic world an unusual development, the Nephilim. They were special, unlike regular people, incredibly strong and larger than life. Paradoxically, they seemed to worsen the world's problems. They were admired, feared, and perhaps even worshipped, pulling people away from their divine creation and causing immense sorrow. The Bible states that the Lord regretted having created human beings on earth, and his heart was deeply troubled, Genesis 6 verse 6, New International Version. It was a divine grief, a sorrow so deep that transcended human understanding. Imagine a parent's heartbreak over the actions of a wayward child, amplified infinitely. So, in his great pain, God made a difficult decision, Genesis 6 verse 7, Amplified Bible, So the Lord said, I will destroy mankind, whom I have created, from the face of the earth, both people and animals, and creatures that move along the ground, and birds in the sky. I regret that I have made them. The world had gone astray, but Noah stood out as a beacon of hope, a man of integrity and faith, Genesis 6 verse 9, Amplified Bible, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time, Noah walked with God. Noah belonged to the lineage of Adam, descending through Seth, Enoch, Kenan, and other ancestors who followed the righteous path. God decided to put an end to. Imagine a time when wickedness had taken hold of the earth, and a flood was set to wipe out everything. Noah, however, stood firm in his faith. 
He fully grasped the seriousness of the daunting task ahead and embraced it with a determined heart. God had declared, I'm ending it all due to the violence that fills the earth, I'll destroy both people and the earth, Genesis 6 verse 13. In the midst of this chaos, Noah's faith remained unwavering. God deemed him worthy to spearhead a new beginning for humanity. Noah faithfully followed God's instructions, even as those around him spiraled into disorder. Noah's light shone brightly, showcasing the enduring power of virtue and faith amid overwhelming darkness. God's covenant with Noah, detailed in Genesis 6 colon 1, 17-22, involved the construction of an ark, a sanctuary for Noah's family, a vessel to ride above the impending floodwaters. God provided Noah with precise instructions, specifying the use of gopher wood and the application of pitch inside and out, Genesis 6 verse 14. Noah faced ridicule and skepticism as he embarked on the monumental task of building the ark. Despite the challenges, he pressed on, driven by unwavering faith. As we explore the ancient world, echoes of a bygone era reveal a tapestry woven with divine encounters, struggles of free will, and the intricate dance between light and darkness. In this historical expedition, Noah's story stands as a profound testament to the essence of humanity. If you like this content, subscribe to the channel now and hit the notification bell. Don't forget to leave your like so that YouTube can recommend all the videos for you and if you want to delve deeper into the Word of God, keep watching the videos recommended below. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video, see you soon.